Let's start by just defining diabetes. What is diabetes? And tell us about the different types of diabetes. Well, I guess that sort of leads into something else. So what is diabetes and why should we care? So essentially diabetes is whenever you have too much sugar in your blood. That's actually how we diagnose it. And the sugar in question is one that we call glucose. And uh, it's quite interesting. I know you, uh, you love history as much as I do, Peter. So historically, we didn't have any tests to see how much sugar was in the blood. But what would happen is if you had too much sugar in the blood, it would actually overflow into the urine. And as far back as 600 BC, physicians actually recorded that ants were attracted to the urine of diabetics. And, well, it gets worse, though. So in 1674, there was an English doctor. He was named Thomas Willis, and he described diabetic urine, and I quote, as wonderfully sweet as if it were imbued with honey or sugar. Now, uh, that only begs the question, how did, he know how, did he, how did he know? And that's how they used to diagnose diabetes. So uh, you, you have too much sugar in the blood, it overflows into the urine, the urine either attracts ants or you taste it. Now, I so sure, well, high blood sugar, is it a problem? And I think you know the answer to that. Why should we care if somebody has diabetes? And I know that you know a lot about the complications and side effects of diabetes. It, it leads to a huge number of complications heart attacks. Somebody with diabetes has the same risk of a heart attack as somebody who's already had a heart attack. In Australia, it's a single most common cause of having an amputation, having to have a toe or a foot cut off. Most common cause of that is complications of diabetes. The most common cause in Australia of having to be on kidney dialysis, the most common cause of preventable blindness. I mean, the manifestations and the consequences of diabetes are absolutely huge. So in a nutshell, we really should care. Now, the diabetes that we're concerned about is uh, what we call type 2 diabetes. Um, now, when I was uh, in medical school, which is many, many years before you were there, uh, Dr. Mason, um, we used to call that mature onset diabetes. And, uh, and sadly, they've had to change the name from it because people were getting it at such uh, so much younger age. Even teenagers now are getting uh, developing type two diabetes. So they had to change that from mature onset diabetes to type two diabetes. It just shows how things have changed over time. Well, absolutely. I mean, look, you only have to have a look at the graphs that show the rates of diabetes and. Uh, it might be an exaggeration to say it's an exponential increase, but we know this epidemic is only getting worse. And we know that uh, there are, I think the current figures are 1.2 million Australians diagnosed with type 2 diabetes. The belief is that there's at least another half a million who are undiagnosed, who have type 2 diabetes but don't know it. And mm. then probably another two or even more million that have what we call pre-diabetes, which we'll get to uh, get to in a minute. Well, what, um, why don't, well what, what do you mean by pre-diabetes? Well, that's a very good question, Dr. Mason. Um, so the way we define, uh, or the way we diagnose diabetes is based on a blood test. And uh, it's based on your fasting blood glucose or a test that we call the HbA1c, which is a, a fancy test that basically sh shows you what your average blood glucose uh, level has been for the previous three months. So we tend to use this HbA1c as the sort of gold standard for diagnosis of, uh, of type 2 diabetes. And we have a, a range. So if it's uh, 6.5 or above, we call it type 2 diabetes. If it's sort of between 5.8 and 6.5, we call it pre-diabetes. And then below that is, uh, is normal. But the funny thing is that, you know, even though we might call it normal, it doesn't necessarily mean that everything is functioning perfectly underneath because diabetes does not develop overnight. You don't suddenly wake up one morning and, uh, and you're, you know, you've got diabetes. It's taken 10, 15 years probably of hard work to, to get to occur to that stage. So what you're saying is that while 
we diagnose it as an absolute condition. You either have it or you don't. The process of the disease is more gradual. It's on something we call a continuum. And you can have blood sugar level that's higher than healthy, but not yet meeting the diagnostic threshold for official diabetes. Yeah. And uh, tell us about the, the, the role of insulin in all this, because that's really the key factor that I think people need to understand without getting too technical, need to understand what role insulin plays in all of this. Oh, well, I mean, I guess the point is that we've said that diabetes is defined because you've got too much sugar in your blood. Well, that begs the question, why? Why does an individual with type 2 diabetes and understand that this is a type of diabetes that develops with age. So the people, the diabetes that pe young people have, you know, they're 8, 9, 10 years old, um, that's the uh, type 1 diabetes. So in type 2 diabetes, the reason the sugar gets high is because there's a chemical that circulates around your blood. It's called a hormone. Its name is insulin. And its job is to take the sugar out of your blood. And when it doesn't work properly, that's a condition we call insulin resistance. We mean it where the body's resistant to the effects of the insulin. The insulin's not able to do its job properly. So when insulin no longer works properly, it actually allows your sugar level to just slowly creep up over time. And what you've just mentioned there is that we have this pre-diabetic phase, which is before you meet the official criteria for diabetes, but it's still unhealthy. We know that people with pre-diabetic levels of blood sugar are also at increased risk of all the aforementioned side effects. We mentioned heart disease, and it doesn't just include, you know, cardiovascular disease includes things like stroke, uh, dementia. So people don't realise it, but we're now calling dementia type 3 diabetes. Because anything that uses energy is uh, basically metabolism refers to the use of energy. People don't realise that the brain, it's 2% of the body's weight, but it uses 20% of the body's energy. So dementia is actually a metabolic illness and strongly, strongly associated with type 2 diabetes. So the, the problem is that you have this insulin, it doesn't work properly, and over time, these uh, the risk your risks for all of these diseases actually just increases, 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 which probably brings us onto a point of insulin resistance and something we call pre pre diabetes. If that's not getting too fancy, all right, take us through uh, take, take us through a layman's uh, explanation of insulin well, resistance and well, that, uh, that early time. What happens even before? your sugar levels start to increase, is that the body says, hey, the insulin's not working properly. I need to make more insulin. So something, your insulin levels will really increase. And even though you have insulin resistance, meaning the insulin's not working as well as it ought, if you can double the amount of, or triple the amount of insulin you have, then that can compensate. Now, we actually when we actually diagnose this increased level of insulin, this is, we can actually call that pre-pre-diabetes because the sugars are still ostensibly normal, but the insulin is not. And one thing to bear in mind is that the insulin in and of itself can also cause significant side effects. For instance, when we went to medical school, we were taught the concept of something called essential hypertension. So... Essential hypertension just means everyday garden variety blood pressure that people have. And the term essential was to use used to refer to the fact that it had no known cause. It was almost essential that you would just develop it um, as a fact of ageing. Well, what we now know is that essential hypertension is caused by insulin resistance, high levels of insulin. So in a lot of cases... If your doctors have identified that you've got hypertension or high blood pressure, then that's a suggestion that you might actually be pre-pre-diabetic and you might want to consider getting some insulin tests done. Yeah, it's fascinating, isn't it, the link between all these different diseases and they all seem to boil down to insulin resistance being the, uh, the underlying cause. 
So why do people, why do some people develop insulin resistance and then and type two diabetes and and, and others not? Uh, what are the factors that really are important in the development of uh, of type two diabetes, for instance? I mean, does it run in families? Is is it genetic? Is it familial? Well, I mean, absolutely. I mean, it is strongly genetic. In medical school, we got taught the term it's a highly polygenetic disorder, which is euphemistic speak for meaning, well, there's lots of genes that are involved and there's not one particular gene, but it appears to strongly run in families. And this is true, but I think there's a very important point to make here. And this is really important for anybody who's had a parent and watched a parent suffer through this diabetes and the associated diseases. And when I say associated diseases, that includes things like dementia. And that's while genetics might load the gun. It's lifestyle that pulls the trigger. So what do I actually mean by that? We know that some, some people are genetically susceptible to type 2 diabetes. But genetics is not fate. It doesn't have to be that way. You, and I believe the most important lifestyle factor that will prevent you from pulling the trigger is diet. So there, there's no doubt that of all the lifestyle things we talk about, um, the two most prominent being diet and exercise, that diet is hands down the most important. 